and if the panelists want to ask each other questions, uh, certainly the audience is invited uh, to ask questions uh, of, uh, of the panelists. But if you do so, we would ask that you approach the microphone slowly <laughs> to avoid any injury issues um, and, uh, and, and uh, speak clearly into the microphone. You may want to start off, uh, Bob Levy and Kate Owens. A couple of panels mentioned predatory pricing, so let me raise this as a possibility. As many of you know, Microsoft gives away its browser, and when it does so, the government cries foul. Uh, so when Microsoft isn't being accused of, uh, of monopoly price gouging uh, for charging too much, it's being accused of predatory pricing for charging too little. The real money in browsers doesn't come from uh, the sale of browsers. It comes from advertising and uh, electronic commerce. So it's like network TV, which, of course, is free. And it's like controlled circulation magazines, which are, of course, free, but you are obliged, if you get these free services, to look at the advertising. In that sense, the, bro the browser can profitably uh, be given away because it generates uh, ancillary revenue. And this is a, a condition that economists characterize as having a negative marginal cost. And that's why neither Microsoft nor Netscape, who, of course, was the first to price its browser uh, at zero, uh, is engaged, neither of those firms is engaged in predatory pricing. Uh, the browser's zero price is more than its negative marginal cost. That alone negates a predatory pricing uh, claim, uh, the first element of which is that the price has to fall below marginal cost. My question is, what do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> Any comments from any of the other panelists? In person. Oh. All right, I'll vert for. I'll say a few things on, on the subject. Uh, I mean, Rick raised questions about uh, what is predatory pricing, and uh, the reality is that uh, the, this is one of the key issues that differentiates uh, Chicago school uh, approach to antitrust from uh, the post-Chicago. Uh, reconstruction that's going on and beginning to gain increased uh, adherence. The, uh, in the era in which the Chicago School really dominated antitrust, uh, it almost eliminated predatory pricing from the antitrust vocabulary, uh, coming up with a, an extremely uh, narrow uh, approach, which has been endorsed by the Supreme Court. Um, we, uh, one question that a lot of people are, are trying to deal with is, does predatory pricing exist often enough to be of concern and to be something the government should go after? Let me backtrack for a few minutes before I get to uh, dealing with uh, the question Bob raised. Um, look at airlines. Uh, right now, the Department of Transportation is attempting to deal with what it sees as predatory pricing at Fortress Hubs. Um, they're having a hard time dealing with it because the, the current uh, prevailing law on the subject almost defines predation out of existence, makes it very hard to prove in an antitrust context. And yet when they look, the Department of Transportation, a lot of other people look at what's happened at uh, hub uh, terminals, they find that uh, when new entrants attempt to, to create new airlines or new routes uh, at a dominated hub, that the dominant air carrier comes in, cuts its prices very, very low, puts on additional seating, and continues this until the new entrant gives up and exits the market. This has happened time and again. And uh, finally, the Department of Transportation is trying to deal with it. But they're faced with a problem of, hey, I see it out there, and it's happening, and it's real. But the economists and, uh, and those who've taken their cue from the Chicago School Economists on this, and Nick and I are both graduates of the University of Chicago Law School, we just disagree about uh, some of this. The economists say this it happens so rarely, that, uh, and it's too dangerous to go after it because we will freeze uh, aggressive competition. We shouldn't go after people who price their products too low because what we want is low pricing. 
The problem is, if you look at the uh, air hubs, as soon as the uh, new entrant uh, exits the market, the dominant firm raises its prices very high. Now, there are a lot of, a lot of issues here. One issue is what do we mean by recoupment? When we say that um, you only engage in predatory pricing if you can recoup your investment, the lost money, uh, through higher prices, that's a very narrow interpretation. It's narrow because uh, the rationale for predatory pricing may be different. It may be uh, we're going to establish ourselves as a company that everybody else knows is a real aggressive competitor and that we will punish anyone that comes in against us. We won't necessarily recoup our investment in this particular market where we cut the price. We may recoup it in other ways through the strategic uh, advantage that we gain against our competitors. Um, there's also a problem in this field of what does it mean to price below cost. Now, there's been a lot of, of difficulty defining exactly what we mean when costs are relatively stagnant, but when you enter into a, a network type of industry where the marginal cost falls way down low, whether it's uh, software where the the marginal incremental uh, unit of software costs almost nothing, or in airlines where the marginal cost for one more seat may be next to nothing. And then we set up a test where predation can only occur if if uh, the price is set below the marginal price, the marginal cost, we've set up a situation where you will never be able to prove uh, predation. And then if you do, as Rick suggested, eliminate subjectivity so that intent becomes irrelevant, now you've got it fixed so that you're never going to be able to find uh, the moons of Jupiter. They don't exist because theologically they can't exist. But it's happening out there, and competitors know that it's happening, and strategic planners know that it's happening. Uh, take it back finally to the issue that Bob raised in the Microsoft context where there may be advertising revenues that uh, come along with uh, a browser. Well, maybe. My understanding is that the, if you look at the average cost, of creating the software, uh, you're not recovering average cost uh, out of the advertising. I don't know what the answer is empirically, whether that's true or not true. Uh, this is what I'm told, that, that the average costs uh, are not recovered as a result of the advertising. What, uh, what I would say, though, is if you're if you're giving away the product and you're able to do that in large part because you're tying it to a uh, monopoly and the other guys out there have to make a profit on the product, then you've got an advantage that will allow you to maintain a monopoly and drive out the competition. And that's what it appears to me uh, is the case here. Bob, just uh, quick rule. couple points. First of all, uh, I think it's important to bring uh, back, us all back to something that predates even the Chicago School but is pretty much um, uh, wholly writ in the antitrust uh, realm, and that is the notion that the laws protect competition and not competitors. And I think if you lose sight of that, you pretty much lose sight of the whole purpose of the law. Now, airlines, um, I won't address. I actually happen to represent one, but I don't get paid to, uh, to talk about them publicly. But I will uh, refer you to a study that uh, uh, Professors Ordover and Willig did uh, looking at the DOT rules um, and basically pointing out the perverse results of rules like that how essentially there are a lot of causes, for example, uh, for some of the problems of the discount airlines, not the least of which was the uh, crash of the value jet plane in the Everglades, um, and uh, that the, the result of this uh, search for the moons of Jupiter, uh, we don't really know them, but you know, maybe they're around Mars, so let's, uh, you know, let's uh, blot out all the moons on Mars. Um, the result is that consumers pay higher prices. 
me turn to the Microsoft case. I mean, the real absurdity of the predatory pricing claim is the notion that if you, I mean, it, you know, part of it goes back to the question of integration uh, and whether or not you're going to force a company that essentially makes a product that has multiple functionality inherently built into it, which is what the Court of Appeals recognized, that essentially a company can't provide that product as a whole with those multiple functions exposed to consumers, but instead has to, to charge for each function. The Court of Appeals, at least, thought that was a pretty absurd result, and it was reflected in their opinion. Um, you also have the fact that what the government is focused on is the uh, revenues from browsers. Uh, and, and they say that the harm to competition is the elimination of the revenue from browsers. First of all, if you look at Netscape's initial philosophy and even some of the documents at the time they came up with their first browser, they never really expected to generate a lot of revenue off of browsers, their clients uh, in, in the client server uh, uh, nomenclature. Uh, they really expected to generate most of their money off of servers. Um, uh, it turned out because they had a browser that was out there and they really were so much better initially than everybody else, they found out they could actually charge some people for it and they made some money off of it, uh, which is interesting behavior, but you might say that, gee, that, they maybe thought they were monopolists. But then in a, in a uh, sort of verification of the strength of these markets, Microsoft came along and essentially, I would say, returned the price of browsers to the competitive level, which was to give them away. Now, was that terrible? I mean, was that predation? Uh, well, let's think. Now, predation only makes sense if I can drive my competitor out of the market and eliminate whatever assets he had so they can't come back into the market immediately upon my raising price. Well, did Microsoft accomplish that? Well, no, not by uh, any stretch of the imagination. All that happened was Netscape was forced to compete. They had to look for other sources of revenue, uh, like uh, uh, charging advertising on the portal site, like selling server revenues. Uh, uh, they, in effect, found Microsoft catching up with them, but they haven't gone out of business. Indeed, they're neck and neck with Microsoft. And then guess what happens uh, about three months ago? They sell their company for about eight times its capital market value, $10 billion is what their shareholders got. Now, we should all be so lucky to be predated against like that. Um, the fact is that it's competition, and that's what, if you lose sight in the antitrust laws of competition, and that's what you're protecting in the interests of consumers, you end up with a lot of lawyers and economists sitting around talking about, well, how do we protect the Netscapes of the world? Uh, how do we ensure that what's going on today uh, doesn't go on tomorrow, ignoring what's going on around the marketplace that's going to change things anyway, beyond what you can imagine? And that ultimately is the problem with uh, DOJ's case, because maybe it sounds good in theory, but when you actually look at the facts, you actually look at the way the market is operating, um, it's very hard to see how consumers and competition are being harmed. And frankly, I think that's what a lot of people, you know, that we've talked about the man in the street. That's why if you tend to, I mean, if you believe that there is wisdom in the common man, um, and you believe that that ever gets revealed in polls, then I think those who, who uh, may think that it's great that common man is now paying attention to antitrust, and I, I tend to agree with that, will uh, be surprised to learn that the common man thinks the government's case generally is all wet and that remedies like breaking up Microsoft are absurd by very large majorities. Uh, Professor Zutrain? I love Rick's invocation of polls as a way to figure out this problem, sort of antitrust by Ricky Lake. But um, that aside... Uh, chart, but I don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> that aside, um, I just want to trace where the argument is she right now. She could not be here today, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. Perhaps more people would have voted to see her than us. Um, but that aside, here's where I think the argument is right now. It's the typical so far Chicago school versus post-Chicago school argument about uh, if you have predatory pricing, is that a problem that we should be chasing as a government or as an uh, instrument uh, in the antitrust system? And uh, the point that has been raised is, well, wait a minute. If somebody exercises in predatory pricing, they give away their product for less than it really costs them to produce it, 
um, that may well drive other competitors out of the market, but then they have to recoup. They're going to have to raise their price later to somehow make benefit off of it. And to say, well, somehow they'll make money in other divisions, well, that may well be true, but what's the benefit of having won your battle in this area if it's a money loser for you? I mean, it does make sense to look at it area by area. So the argument from the Chicago School as we hear it is, uh, it doesn't make much sense to act this way if you're a rational market actor, because after a while you're going to have to raise your prices to recoup, and as soon as you raise your prices, everybody comes streaming back into the market and clobbers you. So isn't there um, really no problem? And the airline example was uh, what we used to see. And now we had some response to that with the idea, well, it's hard to kind of enter and exit really quickly with an airline. You don't just buy a few 737s the minute that Delta raises their prices after they've successfully driven out the last uh, competitor. But that's sort of on the margins, too. You'd figure eventually uh, that could smooth itself out. But what I want to propose is that this isn't the whole story. Uh, we're working in a networked environment. One of the questions Bob asked to, to start us off was, is there anything different about software and about cyberspace that actually adds to this ages-old debate about, say, predation and recruitment? And I want to suggest there is. And the way I suggest there is is because motion in this environment is uh, Newtonian. It's not Aristotelian. And by that I mean, uh, unlike the traditional model that says the minute you stop competing, the minute you stop innovating and pricing uh, in a way that actually reflects your true costs, uh, the minute you stop doing that, everybody else comes in and competes with you. Your arrow stops moving the minute you stop pushing it. So you can't lay back on pushing it for a while in order to push it harder later. But in a networked environment, that's not so. If you can actually establish an early dominance in a field, there are reasons to think in the network environment that you can retain that dominance, even if uh, you don't have the best possible product uh, revealed either through market preference or through some objective analysis of whether IE is better than Netscape. And I want to say up front uh, at the moment, IE is better than Netscape as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but that's not relevant. Um, the point is, that if you can establish early dominance in the market, look at it with offs. If you get the predominant off out there and everybody starts running it, people start writing applications for it, and then you keep running the off and the applications keep growing. Now, if somebody wants to come up with a competitive off that is, let us suppose, somehow we know it's better. Double blind taste tests show people prefer this new off. There's a problem. It's operating is, system for the uninitiated. Yes. Yeah. It took me a while. Yes. I'm sorry. This operating system. <laughs> the problem is that the operating system doesn't do a whole lot for you without all of these applications that run on it. Um, a great example may be Linux today. You may not have heard of Linux. There's a good reason for it. If you try to install and run Linux on your home computer, not only is it difficult, once you do it, now what? You don't have Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Internet Explorer, all jumping up really easily to be used. This means that if you could establish early on your dominance, say, in operating systems, that gives you a whole lot of momentum, Newtonian inertia, that you can bank on later and is possibly the basis for the recoupment that has been challenged uh, by the Chicago School. Now, the only other question to ask is, well, isn't everybody on an equal footing as far as getting in early so they can be the first and then the lasting competitor uh, in the market. Uh, and sure enough, you know, it might have been through luck or skill or something else that Microsoft originally got its dominance in the home operating system computer market. Why begrudge them that? Somebody had to win, if you're listening to my argument, and that makes sense. The only question then is, in these new markets, markets for browsers, for example, can we have the battle there be quote unquote fair? Maybe there will end up being a dominant browser because of the forces I'm describing. But if there is, uh, do we want to have it be a level playing field where everybody gets a crack at it? Or is there some way in which Microsoft, having already won the war in the operating system area, at least for the moment, can be leveraging that power, that monopoly power, such as it is, in order to be the one who wins in the new territory, say, of the browser? And if the answer to that question is yes, now you have found a basis that actually doesn't contradict the Chicago School thesis to say we need to intervene in some way. Otherwise, the person who takes all in that limited lottery of operating system can cascade into taking all in each and every uh, successor environment. Do we need to define for anybody either network effects or network externalities 
uh, uh, just to make clear what the assumption is that you... Can I comment on it? And I'll, I'll define it as well. Oh, sure. Uh, Bob Levy. Um, the, um, the theory of network effects is, uh, is basically that uh, high-tech high consumers in the Microsoft area are concerned about uh, compatibility of their software applications so they might be seduced into purchasing inferior goods. Um, it, re it refers, when you talk about network effects or network externalities, to the change in the perceived value of a product that's brought about by an increase in the number of, uh, of users of that product. As more people use the product, the more the value rises. The perfect example, I think, is a telephone. If there's only one user of a telephone, the instrument is worthless. You have no one to talk to. But as the installed base gets bigger and bigger, uh, there are returns to scale. The instrument becomes more and more valuable uh, as uh, as uh, you get a bigger and bigger installed base. And so the theory is that the first mover in these markets has an enormous advantage. And that's the proposition that uh, Jonathan um, uh, put forward. However, we have first movers like WordPerfect, which was not the uh, anointed king of word processing for very long, and, and uh, Lotus, which was not the ruler in perpetuity of... Uh, of uh, spreadsheets for very long, and Novell with its uh, server software, which didn't last uh, for very long. And if you have kids like I do, uh, now 15-year-old, but a couple years ago, he was very actively using Nintendo, which of course had software cartridges. And when competitors came along, none of their software cartridges were compatible. So one would think that Nintendo would have a lock on the marketplace. But indeed, Nintendo lost out to Sega. Sega, in turn, lost out to Sony. Sony, in turn, as I understand it from kids now, is losing out to Nintendo once again. So as we see, consumers, when they decide that there's a better product out there, they are not locked into inferior goods. They, in fact, find it within their means to go out and purchase the new products that they prefer. Uh, any other panelists want to uh, weigh in on this? I, I just like, like Professor Page. Um, the, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We need to change tape. Professor Page. I think all sides can see that the network externalities or network effects story has relevance in, in the Microsoft case. Um, but it usually turns out that it doesn't have that many implications for the outcome in the case. And part of the difficulty, one of the reasons Jonathan adverted to is that um, if uh, you view network effects as predicting this, this uh, kind of original sin that you know, you're doomed to one particular outcome, what difference does it make who wins? Um, uh, but there are, uh, there are potentially other uh, difficulties with it. Um, first of all, the network externalities argument has greatest relevance with respect to the operating system itself. It's less clear that there are strong network effects with respect to browsers. Uh, it is entirely possible that uh, because of the nature of the browser market that you can have uh, clearly have survival of a number of competing browsers at the same time. It's less clear that that, 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 will, that will follow in the case of, uh, of uh, the operating system. Um, furthermore, you know, uh, it's also been adverted to that um, the fact that there are network effects doesn't mean that, um, that standards don't change. And we've seen this in you know, numerous uh, examples where beta had the uh, initial lead in, uh, uh, in, in VCRs uh, and was ultimately overtaken by, by VHS. Uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's never the case, uh, even in the context, uh, even if you look at the theoretical literature of network effects, that uh, it predicts that a particular standard will win and then will become locked in permanently. In fact, there are some stories that, uh, in which uh, uh, the market will inefficiently jump to a new standard because people are afraid of being stranded uh, with an old and outdated standard. And, and sometimes new entrants can benefit from that uh, in, in moving to the new standard. So I'm not sure that the theory of network effects uh, tells us very much from a policy point of view on an antitrust issue in this case.
Professor is it, is it training? Now this is a very good question. I'm Mike's saying uh, why browsers? Why should we, even if we credit that there are network effects that take place in operating systems because of the relationship, for example, that I described between the operating system and the applications that kind of keep you locked in, uh, you might say why browsers? And that's a similar question to say why solitaire? Uh, you know now that bundled with most versions of Windows comes a game called solitaire that you play and it's solitaire. And sure enough, if there were budding solitaire manufacturers out there, they may be bemoaning their fate because uh, it's very hard to sell people a solitaire program when there already is one. But again, so what? Uh, you know, that might be what Microsoft chooses to give away, and the price of the operating system must reflect whatever it costs them to write or to obtain some version of solitaire. But I do want to suggest that there is something different about browsers than just any old other piece of software. Uh, in a way, Microsoft's argument that the browser is integral to the operating system actually hints at this. There was a period of time when Netscape as a browser included functionality in it, it still does, but it's no longer really being developed, called Java. And what was Java all about? Java was an idea uh, that said if you write it once, that is directing to software developers, if you bother to write your program once, if you write it for Java, we'll try to see to it that it'll run on any computer or any operating system. This is the write once, run anywhere idea. Now this would be very interesting because if it took place that pretty much everything from a TRS-80 to a Pentium chip computer to a Macintosh to a Sun Spark station, each of them said, Java, I know about that. I'm your operating system, but I can do Java too. And most of the software turned out to be in Java. Then you could switch between operating systems. You like one with a lot of graphics, or maybe you like one without a lot of graphics, and you wouldn't have to make the sacrifice of the software, so long as the software was written in Java. And you could even see launching into the new standard of Java by making sure that Java worked on a Windows machine, the prevailing operating system in the consumer market. If it did, people with Windows machines wouldn't even have to leave immediately. They could just run Java, and when they got a program that was written for Java and not for Windows, they would still be able to run it even though they had Windows. Uh, they also have Java on top of it. So why am I babbling about all of this? Well, the reason I'm babbling about all of this is because Netscape implemented Java in a way that was hewing to this common standard. Internet Explorer comes along and says, we're going to implement Java as well. This is the way that if you have IE, you can run Java software, but we will change it a little bit. Now that's a perfectly rational thing. If the company wants to do it, they can change it. They implement it how they want, although there's another lawsuit on this subject still going on. But now here's the strategic reason why you'd want to change it a little bit. If you change it a little bit, then somebody who is writing their software for Java has to make a decision. Am I writing it for the Java that runs on the TRS-80, the Pentium chip, the everything else, the Netscape, blah, 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 or am I writing it for the Java that is changed for IE, for Internet Explorer? And if I write it for IE, I then have to write two copies. It's not write once, run, run anywhere anymore. And if I write it for the IE, maybe I won't bother to write it for all the other platforms. Now you can understand why the battle, the battle to see whether Internet Explorer will be the predominant browser or Netscape takes on a new dimension. If Internet Explorer beats out Netscape, its version of Java beats out Netscape's version, which means you no longer have the Java that is right once run anywhere. And if Internet Explorer loses, then there is the chink in the armor that is exactly the kind of story that says, here's how beta can lose to VHS in the long run, to say, here is the way in to have the next operating system be different from the earlier one. That's, to me, why the browser isn't just like Solitaire, and why, again, you can see that not only giving away Internet Explorer, but entering into the kinds of agreements that were alleged uh, in the case and that have yet to be ruled upon that say you're using your monopoly power to unduly be able to promote Internet Explorer and get it to become the new standard is actually a form of monopoly maintenance of the operating system, not just a form of establishing dominance in a new little area uh, akin to solitaire. Uh, Bert Four had a comment he wanted to make, and I know that Rick Rule um, appears to be interested in uh, a possible response. <laughs> I don't know how I know that. But, uh. Just two quickies. Uh, number one, Rick is right. There's a mantra in antitrust that uh, it's, it's competition we protect, not competitors. I don't know if that means anything, but 
<laughs> I mean, we all believe it. I believe it. I believe it. But I also believe that at a certain time it, it becomes meaningless. If you've got one one competitor, his name is Netscape, and you eliminate it, have we protect? And we go after this in an antitrust case. Have we protected a competitor, or are we protecting competition? Uh, so it comes a point where it doesn't mean too much. Uh, the other thing is we're telling different stories, conflicting stories. Uh, the court is going to have to decide which story uh, is closest to the truth. Um, the different stories lead to different kinds of remedies. So when we complain that uh, there hasn't been enough discussion of remedies, that, that the government has not gone forward explaining precisely what remedy it, it wants to have invoked, one of, one of the reasons for that is not just strategic, but until you narrowly define the violation and uh, with some finality, it's very difficult to talk rationally about the remedy. And we're in that position right now. Uh, let me uh, just make one, make one response to, uh, to what Bert just said, which I think is a very good point and it kind of relates to uh, one of the things that uh, Professor Orland talked about. Um, one of the difficulties, for example, with the list of potential remedies that were discussed is, in some way, uh, there's no evidence in the record concerning any of the violations that they might address. I mean, there's sometimes uh, urban myths about some of those, but the frank uh, fact is the government hasn't done anything to, uh, to try to prove, for example, that Microsoft engaged in predatory pre-announcements or something of that sort. Um, so there is some need to, I think, tie remedy discussions uh, to the issues, though, as I think I suggested, and I certainly want to uh, emphasize here, I believe it's a premature discussion, uh, and it may be, at the end of the day, a discussion that's best held on campuses because it's really an academic question when Microsoft wins. But um, Java, uh, uh, Jonathan has a, a, an interesting uh, description of Java that, frankly, is the first time uh, I've ever heard anyone quite uh, describe the facts uh, the way Jonathan did. Java is actually a language um, that is uh, was developed by Sun uh, that is still out there, that is still in fact being improved uh, and indeed Java 2.0 is about to be released. Uh, Netscape never did a particularly good job of, uh, of actually implementing Java. Um, uh, and in fact, at one point, they were thinking about writing a browser based in Java and basically gave up. The problem with Java has always been that write once any, uh, run anywhere has, uh, certain trade-offs because there, you, you, I mean, basically what you have to do is find kind of a common denominator across all operating systems currently, and there are things like, uh, there are no, uh, you can't, there are no, uh, printer drivers. Uh, in Java, so you have to write you have to write that separately, uh, the way Java uh, uh, class libraries are currently uh, constructed. But the bottom line on Java is that the way Java works is you've got to put what is called Java Virtual Machine on an operating system, and once you have that piece of software on any operating system, which is like an application, um, it can run any Java program. The fact is that. Uh, the last time Java virtual machines were evaluated uh, by PC Week magazine, guess whose uh, Java virtual machine tended to do the best job of uh, running pure Java uh, programs? It happened to be Microsoft's. And guess how you get that uh, Java virtual machine? You get it every time you buy a copy of Windows 98 or somehow acquire it. And it's not doesn't have anything to do with IE. Um, and there, most people, uh, when they distribute programs written in Java, in fact, in almost every case that I'm aware of, typically distribute with their program a virtual machine so it'll run on an operating system. So in effect, while there is some evidence that, uh, that Microsoft in 1995-96 viewed Netscape as a potential alternative platform, because if you go back to that time, Netscape was talking about, in effect, commoditizing uh, the operating system by basically converting uh, the browser into a shell that essentially went over all operating machines. It had nothing to do with Java. 
Java is a different issue. It's a platform. Essentially, what Microsoft is being accused of doing is, although it implements pure Java very well with its virtual machine, because of some of the difficulties with Java, Microsoft also created a mechanism that a programmer using the Java language can write part of his or her program in Java, but then for certain aspects can make direct calls on the Windows operating system, can go directly to the APIs in the Windows operating system and do things that you can't do with pure Java. Basically, Microsoft created an option. Pure Java will run on, on Microsoft virtual machines. Uh, uh, these other programs that make direct calls to Windows will also run. Uh, and the dispute is with Sun is whether or not Microsoft supports something called JNI, which is Sun's version of how you make direct calls on specific operating systems, uh, not across all operating systems. So the real question is, which can Microsoft provide for uh, software developers who want to write programs that call on the uh, Windows operating system? Does Microsoft have to do what Sun says, or can Microsoft provide an alternative for developers that developers happen to want to use when they don't want to write once run anywhere. Now, in my view, maybe I'm wrong, I always thought providing an additional alternative in the marketplace generally was a pretty good thing. And you can have a debate about Java, but it really is a debate that is distinct from the browser. The government, to some extent, has tried to mix the two issues up, but Java is a separate platform uh, it may be a competitive platform. It's one that Microsoft worries about and still worries about a lot, but it was a different platform that Netscape was promoting back in the 96 time frame that uh, essentially the documents deal with, not Java. We have uh, one question from the audience, and I think uh, because of the time, we should then adjourn for lunch, and then we'll have time at the end of the day uh, for an, a substantial additional uh, discussion period. I'm going to uh, speak into the microphone. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm uh, Bill Swigert from Swigert and Egan in Boston. <clears throat> and uh, just a as an aside, I played golf with a couple of uh, uh, engineers in Seattle who were uh, employees of Microsoft Corporation this summer. And they had just, uh, they were plowed out of their minds, actually. They just come from a, a party celebrating the, the, uh, the that day they had released the Java software developers kit, and they agreed to play golf with me only on the condition that none of my clients had any connection with Sun with uh, Sun Microsystems. <laughs> so, uh, and any, one of the um, remedies that uh, that I've read about recently that might be the best outcome would simply be a finding that uh, Microsoft Corporation is a monopoly. I, I know they spent an awful lot of time and effort in the, the first uh, few months of the trial simply trying to defend against that charge, which seemed to me quite ludicrous. And they obviously are a monopoly. Um, I wonder if any of the uh, panelists would be interested in commenting on the, um, the fact that, uh, you know, going forward, if there is a finding of monopoly, and I don't see how that, it, assuming it's not settled, I don't see how they could avoid that. Uh, if that in and of itself might constitute a remedy and that it, it will um, enable their competitors who, are, who will hopefully be facing them in court in the future in private actions, uh, would give them a lot more leverage in being able to um, uh, have a presumption in, in their favor since they're dealing with, with a monopolist. Recognizing that having monopoly power and exercising it unlawfully are, of course, two different things. Um, I don't know if we can do this in a few minutes. Um, uh, there's a lot to that question, and uh, if someone wants to take a crack at it, I'd be most appreciative. Bob Levy. I just want to take uh, 10 seconds, and that is uh, um, I do not presume that Microsoft has a monopoly, and this afternoon, if you folks will hang around, I'll give you a lot of good reasons to believe that they do not have a monopoly. It's a tying arrangement. I'll stick around. I'll just add though. <laughs> well, it'll antitrust humor. <laughs> just, just uh, one Professor point. Page. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, while there uh, there are strong economic arguments that Microsoft's market share does not necessarily confer, monop confer monopoly power in the same way that it would for uh, uh, other firms with similarly high market shares, uh, I think it was probably a strategic mistake for Microsoft. Um, to defend, to, to try to contend that they lack monopoly power under prevailing legal standards because uh, the, it was the beginning of a pattern that's occurred throughout the, the trial in which 
contentions related to its positions were made to appear ridiculous to the court. And re regardless of how peripheral they might be to the particular issue, uh, it tended to create the impression, uh, at least in the public mind, if not the courts, that Microsoft's witnesses were not credible, and that applied to both their expert witnesses and to their fact witnesses. So, uh, you know, I, I agree. It's, it's not clear, even if you agree with the economic argument that Microsoft's monopoly could disappear, you know, in, in fairly short order, that it was necessarily the best strategic tack to fight in, to the death in that particular ditch. Okay. And one, one more comment by Professor Kovacic, and I think we will adjourn. Uh, the finding of monopoly power could be used by other litigants uh, and would enable them to start their cases with an assumption, assuming they're challenging the same basic market position, would allow them to focus on conduct concerns rather than monopoly power. That's an advantage for the private litigants. The offensive use of collateral estoppel for those in the legal business. Uh, I'd, I'd add quickly, though, that uh, the disposition of the conduct issues becomes terribly important as well, because if we assume that this goes to the distance, and God help us if there's a settlement, um, <laughs> but, uh, but if, there, if, it, uh, if it does go to the distance, there will be significant treatments of each and every one of the significant uh, conduct issues, and those conduct issues, uh, the disposition of those issues, would be a, would probably be a major hurdle for the for the same litigants. But but if I'm if I'm thinking of bringing a private suit and uh, and I, I see a favorable outcome on that issue, uh, that's a plus for me as a private plaintiff. Can, can I just mention one one point? Real yeah, quickly? I know because Rick and Tico will not be able to be here this afternoon right. to with, with defend himself. So. Well, I may I may be here for a while, but I'm going to have uh, I will have to leave. The one point that I would make is uh, that this case raises an interesting issue that I think is kicking around in the courts in a variety of different cases, and that is how in in markets like this that. Uh, where you see um, intellectual property as being an essential element, does one distinguish between rents uh, that are generated by that property and monopoly? Um, and quite apart from this case, you take, for example, a case like Toys R Us, where the intellectual property really is different, but it's a trade name uh, and consumer uh, uh, goodwill that has been generated by the company. The FTC um, and I think certain trends are beginning to obliterate the importance of monopoly power and create uh, the opportunity for increase for attacking an increasing range of unilateral conduct uh, by confusing what are rents to intellectual property with monopoly power and essentially being able to skip over the monopoly power issue and go directly to conduct. And that's why and maybe it was a mistake to focus on traditional analysis, but I do think that this case, the Intel case, although it was settled, and other cases raise a very interesting question about how do we deal, how do we distinguish uh, intellectual property uh, from monopoly. And if we're not going to distinguish it, then it means almost every company, like a pharmaceutical company, like a, a software company, uh, like any company that provides consumer goods, may essentially have to view itself as a monopolist for Section 2 purposes, and I don't think that's what the law was intended to do. I want to thank everybody this morning and early this afternoon for stimulating discussion. We will adjourn.